we always see the future through the glasses of right now and the past. In, in some ways, we're always looking at the future through the rearview mirror. So we're not quite living in the future. We're living in the rearview mirror reflection of the past. So we define everything from the, uh, the nomenclature of the past, the horseless carriage, the flameless candle, talking pictures. For Monday, September 30th, 2019, this is episode 52, Brian Romilly, Amazon's hardware announcements, the keys to the castle, Echo Buds, Echo Frames, Echo Loop, and more. Brian is known as the Oracle of Voice. He even coined the term voice first. And over the past few decades, he has predicted so many things that came true. Brian and I talked about how patents telegraph the future and are highly strategic, plus the brilliance of these new products like Echo Loop, which is about getting Amazon into the castle without fighting for body parts or spaces that are already taken, like the wrist or the pocket. A big theme is getting out of the weeds of technical features, like how does the carburetor work, what's the exact RAM of the computer, and just looking at better ways to get work done, to accomplish tasks. Think bigger. We're looking at the beginnings of new use cases in brand new paradigms. And when you paradigm shift, the canvas is blank, and that's where we are with voice. Thank you to our wonderful sponsors at Trinity Audio. With Trinity Audio, publishers and bloggers can turn their readers into listeners by turning their written content into lifelike speech. All it takes is a short snippet of code to audiofy your entire website. Get started for free at trinityaudio.ai. Welcome to the Beatle Moment Marketing Podcast, a short weekly exploration of marketing, voice technology, and business. I'm Emily Bender. I answer to no one, and I make this for you. Let's get on with the show. Welcome back to the show. I'm Emily Bender, and I'm here with a super special guest, Brian Romilly, known as the Oracle of Voice. He's the one who coined the term voice first, and... Brian is the recognized world authority on how voice AI will impact computing and commerce. Over the arc of his career, Brian has built and run payments and tech businesses, worked in media, including the promotion of top musicians. He's explored a variety of other subjects along the way and been published in basically everything. Forbes, Huffington Post, Newsweek, Slate, Business Insider, and is even an exclusive Cura top writer Brian has hosted the Around the Coin podcast, which was the earliest cryptocurrency podcast discussing everything from Bitcoin to voice commerce. The list goes on. Uh, Brian, I can't even get through everything you've done here, but I'm so excited to talk to you. Welcome to the show. Wow. Thank you, Emily. I really appreciate it. And um, I have been a uh, listener of yours since the beginning. So this is really quite an honor being here. Yes, I am so excited to dig into a few topics with you. So the first one, let's start with the recent news. The biggest announcements from Amazon's fall 2019 hardware event were, in my opinion, a few of the products that are coming out that are Alexa enabled. And I really would love to get your point of view on loop, frames, buds, but more importantly, the one that nobody's talking about, which I I would love for you to actually explain. So what do you think happened with these announcements and and where is it all headed? That's a great question, Emily. And and I think, you know, there's a bit of a myopia about anytime new technology comes out, we just kind of see the iteration in the next couple of feet in front of us. But I I come to know products and, uh, and companies through their patents. I've been studying patents for decades and patents telegraph and nuance the future in ways that most people don't fully understand. Not every patent becomes a product. Unlike what is in popular culture, companies don't patent things strategically and just because. They cost hundreds and thousands of dollars, and they take away very talented people from their work. And when you read patents and see how much work goes in there, most of it's not boilerplate. It's the inventor talking about their invention, and it is beautiful, in my view. A lot of people find them boring. But anyway, I I got to see that Amazon was moving in this direction, and there's a strategy behind it that is really opaque to almost everybody at this point, even observers in the voice-first industry. And so here's how the thesis works. Amazon could not and did not 
uh, really dominate the smartphone. The Fire Phone, coincidentally enough, was released precisely the same day in November as the Echo device. And a lot of people were fixated and beguiled by the smartphone called Fire Phone, which failed and completely overlooked Echo. Hold that in your mind. Amazon went on to lose um, a tremendous amount of money in the uh, Fire Phone, and they did okay with tablets. Uh, the tablets were really an extension of the uh, Kindle Reader. So they, they weren't really a, a new product category. They were really an extension of a category, which essentially just became a tablet, and they kind of snuck their way into it, and they dominate the market to a certain level. So they lost the smartphone. Smartphone is an old modality. It's, it's already 11 years old, the, the smartphone in the incarnation of the iPhone. And, and I use that. I, I mean, Android is out there, and I'm an Apple supporter, and I'm not going to hide that back. Android's out there, but it, it, it really is not the defining system that the iPhone is. So when I say iPhone, I mean smartphone, and it's kind of interchangeable in some ways. So Amazon wasn't able to address that. So what's the strategy? Do you keep going at the front door? Do you keep uh, hitting the castle at the front door where everybody's standing with the hot oil and the moat bridge up? No. You find another way in. And how do you do that? Well, one of the most ingenious things that history will wind up recording, although it may in and of itself may not signal the successful product, but one of the series of successful products that allow Amazon deeper inside the castle. Now, in a way, Amazon's already in the castle by content and by shopping. They are, by the way, the largest merchant on the planet. They're a retailer and not a technology company. And that's fundamentally important in understanding Amazon. And it's fundamentally important why it, was, it took Amazon to create a voice-first company and not a tech company. Now, we can go on for days, as you could tell from pre-show, about what this all means. But uh, keep that in the back of your mind. Amazon does not pretend to be a tech company. They're a company that produces technology. It's a different aspect. So how do they get deeper inside the castle? They have content coming over the wall. They have products coming over the wall. But they don't have the mind share, the attention. And it's all about attention. All that we give, all that consumers really are going to give ultimately is attention to something. So they're getting a little bit, but not enough. Right. So when we the ring, we look at a product like the, Loop or Frames and attention, this part of it is the Alexa is always on. It becomes ubiquitous. And then when it comes to content, how do you see that playing out? Because what's going on with content? Is Amazon actually rewarding people who are creating it? Are we talking skills? We're talking flash briefings. How does this translate to them? becoming dominant in the way with getting into the castle? Emily, that's a wonderful question. Uh, and just take it one step back on the, on, the, on the idea of Loop, though. Amazon is really not going after the uh, AirPods. Amazon is really not going after the wrist, the watch. Amazon's really not going after the smartphone. They're creating a new modality. I can still use the Echo Loop and the Echo Frame and by the way, have my AirPods in and wear my watch and use my iPhone. That's the very sublime brilliance that's around this. So the Ring does two things. Number one, it's a fantastical product. It's designed to make some people polarized. If you feel polarized, it worked. If you like it or hate it, it worked. To get your attention, you sometimes have to create products that define new categories, and sometimes you almost poke fun at the product itself. I say, talk to the hand will become a new vernacular <laughs> if I'm talking into my hand with a Amazon Echo Loop product. So what does that mean? It means I freed myself from having to compete for the space on the ear. I freed myself from competing for the rest and the pocket. I've now gotten into the castle walls very sublimely with a Trojan horse called the laughable Echo Loop. 
and the laughable Echo Frames. The frames are laughable to some people because it doesn't have a video screen. Oh, isn't it that the best do... part about it? Because then they don't have to worry that this is the next Google Glass. Exactly. Exactly. And there's a deep strategy about that because let somebody else fight that battle, which is probably likely to be Apple. Somebody's going to have to contextually argue their point to society as a whole, how these products that record and visually put up screens while we're talking to a significant other, right? You're staring in their eyes. No, you're staring at the sports score. You know, this is all going to come back up again. It's the same things that came up with uh, Google Glass. Google was not in a position to address it because guess what? They didn't even know it existed. They put out the product not knowing the anthropological or sociological impact or the psychological or philosophical impact of their product. And this is notorious of tech companies. They all, <laughs> we don't need to deal with that soft stuff. Well, it turns out if you don't deal with that soft stuff, the soft stuff will deal with you with regulation and uh, uproar. Right. And, um, was, and and that's what happened. You're, that's such a great point because foundationally, when you look at what you're releasing, how does this affect us as as people, as humans, you know, on an animal level, on a cellular level, we've talked about 5G. Are we going to be in a microwave? I mean, you can get so excited yeah. about tech. And like you said in pre-show, which, gosh, that was even a better conversation than I ever <laughs> thought would happen. But it's um, it's something where we're not looking at should we. It's can we, but is it should we or how should we? Exactly. And those thoughtful discussions happen ex post facto. And that's where the danger runs because these products are going to become more and more and more personable and they're going to do more to rip away our privacy. And I have my whole thesis about this. I call it hyper local, hyper contextual and hyper private. And uh, a lot of people think that's, you know, a little far gone, but we'll see where it ends up in the next couple of years. So the ring is innocuous. It's on your finger. It's not overt and it's activated by a, a press of a button. This is important. A lot of people think it's always on for the ring, the loop, the echo loop. It isn't. It's there to draw you in to the Alexa and the echo ecosystem without taking away. I know Alexa's answering in the background. She doesn't know that. Um, and uh, that's another problem all in of itself. Uh, but anyway, um, it doesn't take away from the AirPod. And that is sublimely brilliant. And it's it, it, to me, it's it's here we are a couple of days into this. I've searched. Nobody's seeing this. And it's just like the same thing that happened when the um, Echo device was released in 2014. I was, you know, I'd already been years of telling privately VCs and uh, companies that work with me that this is coming. A standalone screenless device that will be ambient. Uh, that doesn't make sense, Brian. Are you going to tell it to save a file and open uh, an app? I go, no, you don't get it. It's not an interface to control the, the world of visual. It is a different way to speak to context, data, and information. And at some point, it will go on your behalf with agency and assemble what you do in a day and deliver to you before you ask for it. And you'll have a conversation with that like you would a significant other rather than thumb clawing at a glass screen to try to dig away at this information that you think you're looking for and very likely are taken away from looking for it and, and distracted with something else. Now, serendipity is fine. I'm not talking about that. We'll have serendipity. But sometimes, uh, just like my conversations, they digress into a, a black hole. So the ring is one of those products. And so is frames. Uh, frames uh, can sit on your head and allow you to still have AirPods. It sounds ironic, but you're going to see that. You're going to see people still having access to this uh, Echo ecosystem and still have access to their AirPods. Now, if I was Apple, I'd really be concerned right now because the fact that Amazon's able to do this blatantly in the open, just like they did with uh, the far field. This is what I call near field com computing, voice first computing. There's mid field Voice first computing, which is the automobile and other spaces that I don't want to talk about right now. And then there are far field spaces. That's the open room, right? So Amazon's secret weapon over the castle wall, the first kind of one was uh, they couldn't compete with Apple. So, yeah, so what we'll do is we'll get in the home, you know? And of course, that was laughable to a lot of folks. So, oh, this is a quirky device. 
you know, um, it's the fastest adopted technology in the history of technology adoption. 50% of U.S. uh, consumers already have one. We're now approaching 68%. Yeah, 200,000. Are you talking about smart speaker? So it's fastest adopted technology. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the technology elite that review this stuff, it didn't take place on their watch. That's why there's a frustration. It took place organically by the consumer themselves, primarily in the kitchen. It spread to the living room. And then it spread to every room in the house. And that's the uh, success of the Echo uh, product. So what is, yeah. a- what is Amazon doing now? They're bringing elements of that same strategy, blatantly open if you just have the eyes to see and the ears to hear, blatantly open for you to adopt this in the near field. And it's so funny. You said you're talking about when when things get adopted, how important it is for it to actually be hated by some, because those are the products that really yes. hit. Remember the iPad? Yes. Oh, what is it? A menstrual pad? Like people mocked it. And exactly. it is iconic. It was the mocked. tablet. And it is iconic. Apple's tablet is the tablet. Apple's iPhone is the smartphone. And then the Echo first yeah. gen, you know, that's the beginning of voice first, the era the- out of tap, type and swipe, because we've not been like yeah. you. This is your thing. And you said, why do I have to push a button on my washing machine? I should be able to say, wash my socks. I don't care what temperature the water is. Figure it out. Yeah. 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 This is exactly it. And 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 the iPhone was laughed at because it didn't have a keyboard. <laughs> Where is that keyboard? Where are the tiny keys that my thumbs have to pick at? You know, so the same, what is past is prologue, the same set of people. And by the way, I, I, I don't belie the intelligence of these folks. They're brilliant. These are brilliant people, very astute. But we always see the future through the glasses of right now and the past. In in some ways, we're always looking at the future through the rearview mirror. So we're not quite living in the future. We're living in the rearview mirror reflection of the past. So we define everything from the, uh, the nomenclature of the past, the horseless carriage, the flameless candle, talking pictures. Right. I mean, uh, you know, the list goes on. So when paradigms truly change, um, usually it's folks like me that get drowned out because we don't have a platform. The only thing different in this epoch is folks like me can get on social media. And if you're uh, you, you know, you are so driven, you can find it and say, wow, I can watch this actually in real time instead of reading it in a history book. I can actually see voice first permeating in society before the experts. Most of the experts in voice first right now have usually nothing to do with the technology world. And that's beautiful and brilliant in and of itself. These are people that come from different cultures and different backgrounds and different sort of disciplines. And they even more irritate the folks in tech. You know, you'll see them. They'll, they'll, this, uh, you know, there'll be a famous person saying, Remember the voice assistant? Yeah, you mean the thing that adopted that 50% faster than any other <laughs> technology? Yeah, I remember that. You know, and, and yet they will find 300 people to like that and to retweet it and to say, Yes, I'm, I will grab my keyboard. You'll rip my keyboard out of my dead hands. You know, and of course, if computing continues to be, exactly what it was for the last 20 years, sure, you're going to have a keyboard. But computing is not what it was for the last 60 years. Remember, those were punch cards and they were, you know, the secretarial pool uh, taking, uh, you know, dictation from an executive that would ultimately get routed into a uh, computer at some point as a form letter that gets mailed out by a line printer. Do you have a blog or news site? Just as offering print only is a thing of the past, now text only online is becoming outdated. In a matter of months, it will be inconceivable for content creators to offer an experience of reading alone. With Trinity Audio, you can turn your readers to listeners by turning your written content into lifelike speech. Using Trinity Audio's free contact, that's content technology solution, you can engage your audience wherever they are. Plus, you can generate ad revenue while increasing engagement rates on your site. I've done it on Beatlemoment.com. Voice is the future. Why not start today? Visit trinityaudio.ai. And we thank Ron and his team very much for their support of the show. You think about the way these things have uh, transpired in history. 
And you realize there's a way of it. It gets big and it gets bigger until it disappears. The technology disappears. I, I, as I, I was saying pre-show, at one time you and I would have been talking about our carburetors and, uh, and, and the tires and, and all these different features of our automobile. Uh, we don't anymore. We we buy whole products and all the technology disappears. We don't even care about uh, the specifications. Uh, when Steve Jobs started the Macintosh uh, concept, it was a closed box. And they said, what was the processor speed? You ain't going to care at some point, he said. How about the RAM? You're not going to care at some point. How about this? How about that? You're not going to care. All you're going to care is what it does. And here we are in 2019 and you got people who are defenders of Apple, even Apple themselves at times, lifting up the hood and beguiling us with the technology and not what it can do and what it should do. And I can't blame anybody for that. When you lose vision, you get beguiled by the technology in and of itself as an ends to as a means to an ends, or, or no, as an ends to a means. When you're really out to try to get work to be done, all we are doing, Emily, with these systems is get work to be done. So we have frames on our head so we can access a constellation of 200,000 skills or apps. Now, are, are all of those skills and apps valid to an individual? No. Are there problems in the uh, Echo ecosystem and in the way we invoke skills? Absolutely. Uh, we can do the same thing with Ring. We saw the beginnings, the very tenuous beginnings of a use case in the commercial that Amazon put out with uh, Echo Loop. And that was uh, a dad going to what appears to be a Whole Foods market, uh, pressing his ring to ask uh, what's on his shopping list. In my article I wrote for Quora, which will probably be out by the time everybody hears this, I had to rescind it because it was originally part of a bigger report to a client. And there were things in there that they definitely did not want out yet. And they paid for that. So it is repurposed and it takes me time. But one of the things I pointed out is that there are no killer applications yet. Yes, for thank you first. for saying that. And this is that is the worst. When someone says, "What's the killer app for voice?" That's not the right way to think about it. You're you're in you're in two D almost apps apps. I, I completely no. So yeah. what is it then that is this indicative of the paradigm shift, or what what is it that people are kind of looking for, and and how would you phrase it? Well, Emily, that's brilliant, uh, and 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 I tell you. This is one of those things that will make far more sense in the rearview mirror after we've passed it by, after we're already in this world. And, you know, the idea of the app is already gone. It, it, I ask anybody listening to our voices right now, how many apps did you download in the calendar year 2019? New apps. Okay. Now, now think of that number and how many apps do you actually use on a regular basis? And that's going to come down to no more than two handfuls, if you're lucky. Now, what does that say about this whole, you know, this whole concept that we're in this app world? Again, the rearview mirror tells us that many entrepreneurs made millions, billions of dollars in selling apps. They will continue to do that. But those days are over. The gold rush days are over for building apps. You know, and I'm not saying everything that ever can be invented has been invented. Don't get me wrong about this. Of course, of course, they're going to be, you know, as the technology nuances forward and iterates forward, they're going to be openings on the canvas we call technology to build a new color palette. Fine. That's iterative. That's an iterative type of thing. But when you're paradigm shifting, the canvas is blank, right? The canvas has nothing on it. And that's where we are with voice right now. Now, some people say the killer app is setting timers, sometimes humorously. <laughs> some people will say the killer app is playing music. And to some extent, that, that might be, but that's not really what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is the intimate relationship that technology will spawn when it is allowed to do that with safety and privacy. And we're not in that place yet. And so you can't see that world clearly until you're in that place. And that requires a lot of commitment and contracts with uh, implicit and, ex and explicit with people. 
So Ring, the loop, the echo loop already has an explicit contract with the world. It's not recording anything unless you press a button. It's in your hand. It's already intimate. Let's think about this. When we, thought, when we first saw, saw the AirPods, a lot of people thought it looked ridiculous. What are those Q-tips hanging out of your ears or what? You know, did you not, you know, did your wires get cut off your uh, earbuds? All these things. Now it's ubiquitous. You have people saying, talk to the hand. I find it extremely humorous, you know, uh, or put a ring on it. It gets even funnier. The jokes don't stop. But what we're saying is we're not trying to battle on the grounds of defined by the prior technologies. We're battling on a new ground. Now, is that the answer? No, not necessarily. I happen to think there, there's 175 that I've been able, approximately 175 modalities that you can use voice first in that fall under near field, mid field, and far field. We've only seen about four. Four. And yeah, four. So, you know, we're not even beginnings with this. So the ring is a ring a test, perhaps. I don't think so. I think it's going to be shown as an ins- as an inception point. Uh, frames, is that a test? No, it's an inception point. Does it telegraph visuals? Of course. But I think the strategy of not being the first to do that again is brilliant. It shows restraint by Amazon. It shows intelligence and it shows wisdom. They're merely giving you more utility to an ecosystem that exists. And that is the brilliance of these products. Now, I didn't say anything about Buds. What are Buds? Buds will try to displace AirPods, right? Of course they are going to release that. But I don't think they expect to win that. Are they good quality uh, you know, in-ears? Absolutely. I call them in-ear monitor quality. This is what us musicians will wear on stage. Uh, they have two speakers or two drivers uh, or inductors or however you want to term them. A lot of people get angry because of my terminology, you know, but in reality, there's two drivers in each ear. And, and the more drivers you have, the higher the fidelity and, and the more that experience is, is high resolution. And Amazon's starting to move down that road at a consumer price. My in-ear monitors, uh, Emily, I'm sad to say at one time, cost $5,000 an ear, and they had to be custom fitted. Uh, if you see uh, Taylor Swift, uh, her in-ear monitors, they're about $10,000 an ear. And a lot of yeah. people are crazy. There, there's nine drivers in the ones that she's wearing, nine in those ears. So that's very important when you're on stage because stage is loud and you have to overcome that. You need to hear, if you want to be pitch perfect, you have to hear precisely where the sounds are. Well, with the buds, there was a big focus on noise isolation. They incorporated Bose's smart noise isolation, make it easier to hear what you're listening to. But surprisingly, these buds will work with the current voice assistant, whether that's Alexa, Google Assistant, or Siri. So, Brian, let's wrap up on this topic and just tell us what el- what else matters about buds here, and, and how come they wouldn't displace AirPods? Um, because I think AirPods are a cultural phenomenon, and they're about they're about fashion as much as they are about sound. And and a lot of people get mired in this conversation. They think it's wimpy to talk about the fashion element. And, and, and that's ridiculous. Uh, you know, every purchase we make is emotional and these emotional purchases that we make uh, define who we are. And we weave a tapestry with the manufacturer and the product. And, and we're, 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 we're brand signaling as we're walking down the street with our Air- AirPods on, as we did with the white earbuds when the iPod first came out. There's no difference. We keep doing it. We will continue to do it. It's who we are as humans, right? So I think Amazon is wise enough to do these other modalities, the, the uh, loop and the frame, and there's others. So you'd be surprised what's coming down the pike for, from Amazon. And I, I I don't want to say it right now because I, I, I cut some slack. So people get angry that I pre-broadcast what companies are going to do. I give them a lot of slack, but there are things I can tell you right now that is most definitely we're going to see within six months from Amazon that are not loop or frames related. Wow. Uh, clients will, uh, clients already know that. So the buds are open to other ecosystems. That's an important point. We can do a whole show on what Amazon did with the new initiative. Uh, it's an open voice first initiative that they have. Um, 
but and it's similar to what AOL did when they uh, opened up uh, AOL mail to the internet mail system back in the 90s. Uh, and Apple and Google are not present. Their hands are not raised. And that's going to be very interesting in the future for them. Um, but, you know, will some Apple users get buds? Of course. Uh, what are the reasons? There are going to be a lot. One of the reasons could be subsidies. When Amazon subsidizes the buds for you to get Amazon Music at a, a significantly lower basis and high res music with their HD format, uh, you may give up. The commodity of music. Music's a commodity. Let's always remember that. The music does not taste, smell, or feel different when it comes from Apple than it comes from Amazon or Google. It doesn't. So whenever anybody gets excited over selling a commodity product, remember that that 12 or 20 bucks a month you're paying, the artist gets precisely the same amount of money, whether it's Google doing that, Amazon, or anybody else, Apple. So the companies that sell you that music are making nothing on it. Let me tell you, repeat that again. When you stream music and you stream it to the level that most people, it's a loss leader. They're making nothing from that service. Uh, even though the artist is really painfully getting ripped off by streaming services, in my view as an artist, the companies that are selling you the service, the endpoint service, Apple, Netflix, uh, Google, you know, uh, Spotify, whatever doesn't matter. They're making very little money on it. If not, well, like I really, let's say nothing because when all is said and done at this point, it's lost leader. So, so the strategy is attention. It's about a narrative and communication and relationship that you build with the customer. Amazon's brilliant about that. That's what Prime's about. Prime's about a, a, a long-term relationship. Apple's trying to do that with their brand and they've been very successful. They're now trying to do that brand extension around services and that's very questionable. Uh, if, if I hear, uh, you know, I don't know, uh, a Fleetwood Mac song on, on Apple uh, AirPods, is it really that much different in earbuds uh, from Amazon? Does it sound? You know what you said about the long term relationship? That yeah. is so key. And I think let's let's definitely talk about that. I think um, I want to wrap up on this topic for now about hardware and then segue into the marketing and e-commerce aspect of what does it mean to have a voice presence for brands? Perfect. We stop the tape there, but tune back in next week for part two, where Brian and I discuss the foundation of what makes a brand great and ideally timeless, and how this will be make or break as we do more through voice. We cover archetypes, throw in some of my man Carl Jung and the powerful narratives that truly make marketing meaningful and a force for good. Not to be missed, subscribe in your favorite podcast app at bit.ly slash playbeetle, all lowercase, or visit beetlemoment.com and click media podcast episodes. You can click to subscribe in all the major podcast players right there. Or bit.ly slash playbeetle opens it right on your phone screen in one click. Want to discuss this episode? Have thoughts? Comments? Tweet me at Emily Vinder, and you can always reach Brian Romilly. He's at Brian Romilly. That's R-O-E-M-M-E-L-E. -E -E. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week.